This video is going to be about hypothesis testing, and it's going to be an example where the alternative hypothesis is greater than. In the first video about hypothesis tests, we did an example, probably too long, where the alternative hypothesis was less than. What we're soon going to figure out through multiple examples about hypothesis testing is that really the alternative hypothesis is the uh, is the hypothesis where you have a choice about what kind of comparison you want to make. And simultaneously, we'll realize that the null hypothesis is almost always equals to. So in this video, we'll do some quick uh, recollection of hypothesis testing in general. Then I'll show you all um, a really helpful plot that I think will be the key to computing p-values. This key is going to depend on the alternative hypothesis. And then we'll do an example in R about possums. And hopefully this video is going to be much, much shorter than the last. And we'll start moving through hypothesis testing more quickly and more smoothly as you develop an understanding for the machinery that's going on behind the scenes. So let's recall hypothesis tests. We want to use data to evaluate which of two competing hypotheses seems more likely given the evidence we have. So really, this is just a statistical method that helps us determine which of two hypotheses seems more likely given the evidence we have, given some data, which of these two hypotheses seems more likely. And please, I want you to remember that I'm trying to focus on, hey, what happened to all my colors? Oh, there they are the phrase seems more likely because in the world of statistics, I don't want us getting ahead of ourselves and claiming that we are proving some sort of objective truth. All we're doing is finding evidence in favor of one or the other hypotheses. We are not proving anything about science, just finding evidence. So in this world of hypothesis testing, this is our overall goal. The way we do this is by stating our hypotheses with a level of significance From there, we collect some data relevant to those hypotheses. With the data, we calculate a test statistic. And I think a key part of the test statistic is remembering that within the hypothesis is baked the null hypothesis. With the test statistic in hand, we calculate a p-value and compare that p-value to our level of significance. Once we make that comparison, we can then decide based on the evidence contained in our data, which gets transformed into a test statistic, which of the competing hypotheses seems more likely. The general rule is when the p-value is low, specifically less than the level of significance, reject HO. That's the null hypothesis. I kind of like this phrase because it's a little bit uh, it rhymes, so it helps you remember it. When p-value is low, reject the HO. Reject the null hypothesis when the p-value is less than the level of significance. When the p-value is low, reject HO. Otherwise, don't. So that was our quick recall hypothesis tests. Hopefully, that was sufficient for you all. If it wasn't, then we have a previous video for you to go back and watch the intro to hypothesis testing. OK, so we'll clean up our screen, because for whatever reason, I like using one screen more than I like using two. And we'll move on to the key, the key to computing p-values. 
So the key to computing p-values is it depends on the alternative hypothesis, which is commonly denoted H subscript 1. So the alternative hypothesis has three basic options. The options for the alternative hypothesis, denoted H subscript 1, are less than, greater than, that's what this video is going to be about, or not equals to. Now what we saw in the video for less than is when H1 has less than in it, then we are interested in area under the normal distribution or T distribution to the left. When the alternative is greater than, we are interested in area to the right. When the alternative is not equals to, we are interested in area in both tails. Now I'm going to draw this picture a few times. This is part of the key to calculating p-values, but almost more importantly is the R code associated with these options. So I'm going to leave the picture corresponding to what we are focusing on in this video. And I'm going to remind you that if we're calculating a, um, a p-value for a hypothesis test about proportions, that is, we have some proportion like p greater than 0.5. Because it's about proportions, we're going to use the normal distribution. So in order to get area under the tail, we want to use the function p for probability, because probability corresponds to area under the curve. And we're on the normal distribution, because we're interested in proportions. So if we have a test statistic named z, you would think that you just jump to the function named p norm to calculate area under the curve relative to your test statistic named z. But in fact, you wouldn't, because just like the q norm function, p norm calculates all the area to the left. But we want, because of the alternative hypothesis being greater than, all the area to the right. So the key here is remembering that if all the area under the curve is equal to 1, we want 1 minus p norm. That is, all the area under the curve is equal to 1. And if we subtract off all the area under the curve to the left of z, then we're going to get this picture out. I hope this makes sense. If we start with all the area under the curve, all of it, and we subtract off all the area to the left of the value we want, we will end up with all the area to the right, which we're interested in because the alternative hypothesis here is greater than. OK, that's the key. Calculating p-values depends on the alternative hypothesis. In this video, we are focusing on uh, an alternative hypothesis with greater than in it. Because it says greater than, we want area to the right. Since p-norm calculates area to the left, we will do 1 minus p-norm to get all the area to the right. We will use that key trick in an example in R. So I got an empty R workstation here, but I'm going to introduce you to this data set first. Oh, so here we are, uh, github.com forward slash my last name forward slash data. It's my data website. I like the data set down here named Possum. You can read about the possums as you wish. It's essentially a data frame with 104 observations, and we're going to focus on the possum's age. We are going to create a variable 
out of the variable age. So let's go ahead and just read this data set in. Oops. To R, we could look at the first six. Let's zoom in once because I think that helps you all see it. You can look at the first six observations of this data set. You can see age here is eight for the first possum, six, six, six for the next three possums, two and one for the next, uh, for the fifth and sixth possum. The variable I'm going to claim we're interested in, I'm going to name X because I don't have very clever variable names, but I'm going to create a variable using the possum's age, and I'm going to ask which of the possums are greater than two years old. So I'm inherently creating a variable named x that consists of trues and falses when specific possums are older than two years, and false when specific possums are not older than two years. Notice that two is not greater than two. Two is equals to two. So that shows up as false. Now, what we've talked about before is we can create a proportion out of a vector of trues and falses because true is equal to one and false is equal to zero. But before we even get to that, I'm gonna encourage us to plot the data. So we're gonna use the library ggplot2. I'm gonna walk you through creating a data frame. Let's go like this. Let's create a table of X. We have 26 possums who are younger than two and 76 possums who are greater than two. But what I really want is proportions. So I could use prop.table and we can see that 26%-ish of the possums in our sample are less than or equal to two years old and 75% are older than two. But really, I want to take that table and turn it into a data frame. Now watch this. The magic of R lets you very quickly create a data frame out of this table. The benefit of that data frame then is we can immediately plot on the x-axis the categorical variable named x and on the y-axis, the frequencies, the proportions associated with those. Now, I imagine a lot of you are going to jump to a bar chart in this example, and I'm going to encourage you to not use bar charts for proportions like this. You should use bar charts for counts, as we did previously, but not for proportions, because these false and this true on the x-axis are really just zeros and ones. So this is a numerical x-axis variable, and this is a numerical y-axis variable, at least as far as the plot is concerned. So if anything, what you want to do is relabel the x and freak uh, axis values. The x-axis is going to be, let's see, greater than 2. And the y-axis, oh, let's put this on a new line because then it looks better, is going to be a proportion. Now that right there is a pretty good plot about the proportions of possums in our data set whose age is greater than two. I quite like it. It's better than a bar chart because bar charts are not for, not should not be for proportions, even though a lot of the world uses them for proportions. I don't much like that myself. So onwards and upwards with hypothesis testing. State hypotheses and the level of significance. Our null hypothesis is P, the true population proportion of possums. Let's just say equals to 0.5. This is P, the true population proportions of proportion of possums whose age is greater than two. We're going to contrast that null hypothesis with an alternative hypothesis about the same population parameter. This whole video is devoted to greater than, and then we put the same number in the alternative hypothesis. Now notice 
I earlier used the words competing hypotheses. What I really mean is these hypotheses are mutually exclusive. They cannot both be true at the same time. So what we're trying to do is evaluate which one of these seems more likely given the data we have. And we will specify a level of significance, commonly known as alpha, equal to 0.05. So here we go. Let's calculate our test statistic. We are interested in, it's a proportion, let's call it p hat, the mean of x. And just for fun, let's look at p hat. Oh, it showed up as na, suggesting that, let's look. We can ask the question, is there any NAs in X? And really, we want to know if any of them are NA. Since the answer is true, inside mean, we need the second argument, NA.RM equals true. And that will suggest that mean, the function, will remove all the NAs first and then calculate the proportion. And notice that 0.75, essentially, is the same as shows up on our plot. This is the proportion of possums greater than two years of age in our data set. We also want sigma hat, so we'll just calculate the standard deviation on our variable x, removing the NAs as we go, just the same. We also need the sample size. So in this case, we got to do that uh, clever trick where we add up all of the not NAs in X. And we see that we have 102 observations in our variable age, so that two possums in our data set did not have ages recorded. Okay, that's where the missing data come from. Next, we need a standard error, which is the sample standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. And with that, we can calculate our test statistic Z. So it always goes in this pattern. You start with your mean, which is a proportion in this case, but that's okay. Then you subtract off whatever value you have in the null hypothesis. Once I can figure out how to click, there we go. And then you divide by the standard error. So our test statistic right here almost always follows this pattern. Mean minus the value in the null hypothesis divided by the standard error. That's whether or not you're looking at proportions or means. And I am trying to specify difference here because for Proportions, we will use the normal distribution, p norm, relative to the test statistic z. But in this case, the alternative is greater than. So remember our trick, we want to do 1 minus. So in this case, careful with your scientific notation. We got a p value of 0 0.80s and then 7.9. So that's point, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight zeros, point zero, 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 seven, nine. That is much less than 0 0.05, which we've specified as our level of significance. And if you don't believe me, you could just get the computer to tell you so. Whoops. Indeed, p-value is less than your level of significance. And remember our uh, fun phrase here, if the p-value is low, reject HO. So our statistical conclusion is reject HO in favor of the alternative hypothesis. Let's make an English conclusion because most of the time our audience doesn't understand our statistical conclusion. And we'll say, 
we have evidence suggesting that the true population proportion of possums who are more than two years old is greater than 0 0.5. Please do take a minute to read this sentence over again. I'm going to do it right now. We have evidence, that is, we started with our data, got our test statistic and calculated a p-value, which suggests we reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative. So we have evidence suggesting that the true population proportion of possums who are, look way up here, greater than two years of age, we have evidence suggesting that the true population proportion of possums who are more than two years old is greater than 0.5. The proportion of possums is greater than 0.5. Notice 0.5 is here. The proportion that are greater than 2 is much greater than 0.5. It in fact looks to be about 0.75. So our English conclusion makes a statement about the same population parameter that's specified in our null and alternative hypotheses. We in fact concluded that the alternative seems more likely that this true population parameter of possums who are greater than two years of age is greater than 0.5. The alternative doesn't say what that greater value is. It su just suggests that this hypothesis is more likely than the null based on the evidence we have. Hopefully this was a shorter than the last video where we recapped hypothesis testing, looked at the key to computing p-values, for alternatives that are greater than, the key here shows up in this one minus business. And then we did this quick, somewhat simple example in R, where to be honest, save a few sentences, this qualifies as a very successful report for your first report, which I'm suggesting should be due around the 23rd. So this is most of the work you all would need for your first report. You're welcome.